Hello, everyone, and welcome to, uh, let's see, I'm missing one person. <laughs> Let me give it one minute. There we go. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this 2.20 p.m. session, uh, Socially Vocal, a discussion on race and diversity in the arts. I'm Tevin Fowler Chapman, Executive Director of Washington Concert Opera and an alumni of the uh, Sphinx LEAD program. Uh, in this session, we'll be discussing the more and less effective and impactful ways to use social media platforms to affect change. Uh, the way that this session is gonna go is I'm gonna start with some introductions of our uh, three distinguished panelists. Uh, we'll spend a good amount of time talking about some of the uh, things that we have seen in our work and that we have uh, been forced to adjust to. And then we'll open up uh, the time in the last 20 minutes uh, for questions from the audience. Uh, and I encourage you to have a lot of questions uh, because we are so happy to answer them for you. Uh, so I will introduce our three panelists today. Uh, our first one is Christopher Anderson. Uh, he is currently the Assistant Marketing Director uh, in New York City at the nonprofit performing arts institution, Jazz at Lincoln Center. Uh, prior to Jazz at Lincoln Center, uh, Chris has held several roles at institutions and uh, music publishing companies, including RCA, Sony, uh, Jive Records, the Apollo Theater Foundation, and the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. Uh, in addition, uh, I have to say, Chris, it's great to see you uh, after so long of not being able to see each other for Sphinx Lead. He is also a member of the Sphinx Lead program uh, and the second cohort of uh, that. Uh, our next panelist is Beth Stewart. She is the founder of Verismo uh, Communications, a PR company that helps artists and arts organizations alike identify their brand voices, tell their stories, and uh, build their squads. Uh, Verismo has worked with uh, mezzo-soprano Jamie Barton, conductor Lydia Yankovskaya, uh, tenor Russell Thomas, the Chicago Opera Theater, and Against the Grain Theater. Uh, through her work, she has helped launch several successful campaigns and initiatives, uh, including Turn the Spotlight, which works to empower emerging arts leaders and create a more equitable future for the arts. Uh, in addition to the amazing strategic communications work that she does, uh, Beth is also an in-demand public speaker, uh, where she shares her vision for a more equitable arts scene uh, with organizations from Banff to Opera America to uh, Sphinx itself, uh, which is great because that's where we are now. Uh, Crystal Glass is our uh, third and final panelist. Uh, she is a PR and communications professional based in Washington, DC with over a decade of PR and strategic communications industry experience. Uh, she serves as the PR and Strategic Communications Director for the Black Creative Group here in DC, uh, a Black owned and operated marketing agency that focuses on empowering small businesses uh, with marketing support. Crystal has a wide range of clients uh, as an independent uh, consultant as well, ranging from Miss Capitol Hill DC to uh, US Black Chambers Incorporated. Her work has been featured in Essence, Forbes, Huffington Post, uh, and many more. And if that all wasn't impressive already, she's also the author of Power and Poise, uh, PR tips for powerful brand publicity. And I may or may not be in contact with her after this because she's down the street from me. Um, so I wanna say to all three of you, uh, welcome to the session. Thank you so much for lending your expertise and voices to this conversation. Uh, so it's, it's safe to say that 2020 was a huge paradigm shift for arts organizations nationwide. Uh, the pandemic forced much of the performing arts world to exist online and rethink the value of digital engagement with audiences. Uh, and in addition to this health and economic crisis, we faced a social crisis. Uh, the arts, specifically classical music, uh, was forced to acknowledge and seek to repair decades 
of perpetuated racial injustices amidst the murders of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and George Floyd. And a lot of this came to a head through social media platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and the like. Uh, so my first question to you all is, you know, since that, since the summer of 2020, uh, how has the conversation of race and identity in the arts evolved in the social media ecosystem? Uh, and we can start with uh, Beth. Hey, hey guys, uh, really happy to be here and to see you all. Um, can you restate your final question for me, Tevin? You said, how has... Yes, how has the uh, conversation of race and identity in the arts evolved in, uh, in the social media, uh, essentially that stage? Yeah, so I think over the summer, um, we saw people's stances and values get a lot more clearly declared. Um, I think that before the summer of 2020, a lot of people had sort of vague, statements toward equity or support of diversity. And I think in the summer of 2020, um, certainly the organizations that I worked with, I encouraged them to be a lot more, um, a lot more plain spoken in their values. So if you believe Black Lives Matter, say Black Lives Matter. Don't say that you support like all groups seeking equity or whatever that is. Um, I also think that we saw um, more more artists who aren't of color or organizations who aren't led by people of color um, be willing to listen uh, and amplify the voices of others' lived experiences rather than just sort of talking in general kind of uh, conference attendees speak. Nothing against conferences or attendees. Uh, Chris, you uh, care to offer your take on this. Uh, how have you seen the conversation on race and identity evolve, uh, you know, miss all of this social change? Yeah, I, you know, I think, and, and just thanks everybody for being here. I think this is really awesome. And thanks, Tevin, for leading this conversation. Um, you know, I think that too much of what Beth is saying is really about acknowledgement um, being kind of that first acceptance stage. And I think a lot of institutions, uh, including my own, um, we had to really look at uh, shifting from more of the transactional view we had of particular uh, communities. Um, and, you know, how does that then shift uh, to engaging uh, those communities and our broader community at the same time without it being transactional and it being intentional and mission-based. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, that comes down to uh, specific, in, in an ex a specific way, if we have programming that's centered around, um, you know, uh, Harlem in the 1920s, and then we're saying, oh, well, this audience now is interested and then after that you know we we connect with the harlem day and uptown and then for the rest of the year we don't ever acknowledge that community i think there's examples like that with institutions across the nation um where you know there's it's a transactional uh it's it's always been transactional because their core audience hasn't necessarily presided in a certain community um and so or that community uh the program that they're providing um isn't being marketed to that community. And so it's kind of um, othered or, or it's kind of an exotic sort of, sort of offering. And so I, I guess what I, ultimately from our standpoint at Jazz at Lincoln Center, you know, for us, we're dealing with a, a fundamentally black music, but uh, we have a broadly white audience. Um, and, you know, even this year we've had to say, you know, we have not actually intentionally ever celebrated or honored Black History Month. I mean, the, the kind of most basic thing that you would think would be obvious for our institution, but because our mission was so focused on a global audience and uh, broadening the scope of who can participate in this black music, um, you know, to best point, we stopped using those words. We stopped realizing that we have an opportunity to take a stand um, and that we lose nothing, but we gain everything by doing that. And so really 2020 for everyone was a year of acknowledgement. Um, but to your point, Tevin, decades of, of things that we have to now work through and undo um, and create better routes for, for everyone. So, yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, what's interesting about, as you had mentioned, Chris, uh, the, you know, despite it being Jazz Lincoln Center, when people see it, you see 
an art form that's pioneered by Black musicians. You see an organization that is led by a Black musician and has a majority Black musicians in the ensemble. And yet that, you know, the understanding of the culture and the social injustices within our field, uh, you know, they're not a given for that organization. Um, you know, since the, you know, since making that realization and uh, what you've said, essentially trying to change the conversation, uh, what have been some of Jazz and Lincoln Center's strategies for changing how you uh, communicate your, I guess, your work towards social justice? You, you, it, briefly, I would say it started internally. It started by having real honest, open and transparent conversations that are tough to have. And I think that, you know, there are many more that will have to come. Um, and again, these are coming alongside uh, institutional changes. You know, our board is being shifted in a way that um, there are more people of color um, coming onto our board. Um, and, and that trickles down into our institution where, um, you know, not to say only people of color uh, can, can make any sort of offering in an institution, but it does matter to have that representation. So that's happening. But at the same time, there's a conversation with the folks that have maybe been in um, those positions of power and understanding that, look, if you bring in that person of color, don't, uh, don't think that that replaces your uh, place at the table for those types of conversations. And so for Jazz and Lincoln Center, you know, we're uh, stepping into Monday and into next month with uh, a, our first really institutional Black History Month celebration um, that's called Jazz is Black Excellence. And so it's just an opportunity for us as an institution uh, to, you know, promote this idea collectively um, through our education efforts, our programming efforts and, and social media. Um, and so, and that, and that has forced conversations internally with folks saying, you know, you know, I, yeah, I had a meeting just a week ago where a coworker said to me, hey, you know, I'm a, I'm a white Jewish woman and I don't feel like I'm empowered to be in this conversation and, and me having to say you are empowered, you know, it, 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 it's similar to me saying, oh, well, you know, Women's Month is, is in March and, you know, I'm, I'm a black male, I'm not empowered, you know, I think getting beyond that is now the next part that's going to be hard for institutions for, it's gonna be hard for people to, to really understand uh, how to balance that conversation and still contribute and not feel like, you know, you're just pushing people of color to the forefront and saying, you guys figure it out. Um, and so I, yes, yeah, so that's for, for jazz. That's kind of something we're literally working through um, currently. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Crystal, you, you have a, a wide range of uh, groups and clients help you work, but probably the widest uh, amongst all four of us uh, from Miss Capitol Hill, again, uh, Miss Capitol Hill, DC, to wealth management groups, um, to, you know, commerce chamber centers. Um, when these conversations of economic and racial justice became amplified last year, uh, what strategies did you employ to make your clients' voices heard? Great question, Tevin, and it's a true honor to be here. And, you know, when I think about everything that took place last year. I think about how the conversation has shifted uh, both positive and negative. On the positive side, really seeing people come together and have the tough but meaningful conversations. And then on the negative side, really seeing that uh, there were groups of people that were truly emboldened to, to come forth from a place of hate and a place of uh, racism and sexism and you name it. So we saw a lot in terms of how the conversation has shifted and changed. And so when it came to my clients, it really was, you know, really starting at the first step of really getting to a comfort level. And, you know, when I think back um, to even our offline conversation, Beth mentioned something that was just so profound. Actually, she asked a question, you know, as, as a white woman here, the only white woman here, you know, what role, how can I be most effective? And, you know, Beth, I commend you high five on that question because it takes a certain level of comfort and awareness in the guts, honestly, to even be authentic enough to say, hey, I'm the only white person here. Um, how can this be more fruitful? And that's where I started with a lot of my clients who, in fact, were either white or other. And, you know, it was I could see just visually how uncomfortable it was for them. And, you know, it really started with a level of you know, making them understand that it has to be an understanding and a basis of comfort. And from there, we were able to talk to talk through everything in terms of 
what to call Black Americans. Is it Black American or African American? You know, how to, um, you know, message around an important issue without sympathizing, but empathizing. And so when I look back at some of my clients and even where I am now with uh, Black Creative Group and us being able to be a voice for BIPOC communities, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, it really is important that the messaging is authentic or at most, at least, that the messaging is reaching and connecting with that target audience. That is, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, and you you touched on a great thing, which also falls in with what Chris had mentioned before, which is authenticity. Mm -hmm. um, whether it is you know the comments of we stand or the statements of we stand in solidarity with the black community, whether it's the black squares, whether it is hiring a person of color mm -hmm. to be in the new face of your organization, we you know we want to make sure that we're you know, enacting and communicating authentic change and authentic goals for change. Mm -hmm. um, for, for you, Crystal, for you, Beth, um, and even for you as well, Chris, when helping to craft these statements of solidarity and, you know, creating the right communication strategies to say, you know, this is what we believe in, how do you, uh, how do you avoid uh, performative phrases? How do you mm. make these messages meaningful? Uh, let's start with uh, Beth. Yeah, um, I think that there are a, a few things I recommend. Uh, the first is that people are actually in touch with the black stakeholders in their organization. Um, I think we saw a lot of people last year who were eager to do the right thing and eager to be a part of the conversation, but very nervous about saying or doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And that kept them from saying or doing anything. And I think we see that a lot, right? Like there's, there's just a lot of pearl clutching at the moment. Um, so I say, start by talking to your black stakeholders, make it clear that you're not expecting them to do unpaid labor on this topic, but get some actual perspectives of the people being impacted by these decisions. Um, and then I think one of the most important things is to focus toward action. So I am, I, I'm sure you guys are, I am at the point where I've just lost patience with like the desire to have a conversation about forming a committee to investigate the possibility of one day possibly talking about doing something. Mm -hmm. um, the organizations that I worked with um, that I really respected uh, for how they handled all of the Black Lives Matters surging last year. Um, I thought San Francisco Conservatory Music did a really good job. So they uh, sat down with black stakeholders, students, alumni, faculty, staff, community leaders, and actually figured out a plan um, and they put money behind it. So they devoted scholarship money toward prospective black students. They partnered with the San Francisco Symphony to develop a 10 year commissioning, pro uh, commissioning project for black artists and black composers. Um, they developed uh, and put money behind faculty and staff positions held for black professionals. And I think that all of those action steps um, are super important. I, I do think it's important to clearly state your values and communicate them. But if it's all talk and all ideas, at the end of the day, I'm not sure what that's changing. I agree with a lot of what you said, Beth, and especially as it relates to reaching out to your Black stakeholders, and I'll add on to that and saying reaching out to your Black communicators, because the truth is a lot of those statements were so bland and fell on deaf ears because it didn't resonate. So in this time of social media, relatability and resonance is everything. People are so connected to visuals and words and what relates to them, you know, due to social media and being connected to people through what they say. And so when you get these statements, if it doesn't relate or resonate with that target audience, then it just falls on deaf ears. So we saw a lot of statements that just kind of flatline, but then there were some really authentic statements that you know, really had thought behind it or possibly a black communicator behind it. And so I think one of the important lessons learned from this is that black communicators absolutely need to have a seat at the table when it comes to communicating social justice issues. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, speaking on both of what you guys were saying, part of this, uh, part of the meaningful uh, messaging is being intention of, intentional about the change itself. 
uh, and for you know, something that I talk about a lot in my own work is, you know, not letting the enemy of good be perfect or not letting perfect be the enemy of good because we're all starting from somewhere, right? Uh, how, you know, especially for a lot of institutions and, uh, you know, individuals and in positions of power navigating this uh, progress for the first time, you know, they're bound to make mistakes, um, very public mistakes at times. Uh, what is the best way to, uh, you know, to rectify these moments in which we, you know, we try and go down a path uh, towards change, we make a mistake, uh, we upset people. What is the best way to uh, counter that or the best way to, um, to approach those uh, moments? Uh, Crystal. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 because I have a great example of Pepsi. If anyone has been watching Pepsi ever since they released that, was it the Super Bowl ad with one of uh, with Kylie Jenner or someone with the Pepsi yeah, can? And so. It was just like, here, Pepsi solves everything, police brutality. And if you've noticed, since Pepsi has become really intentional with their advertising and with their messaging, they have some amazing and compelling messaging out there as it relates to an array of social justice issues. And so that's a really good example of what some would call it, what some would call an innocent mistake, you know, thinking that they could use celebrity power and use their product to send a message that, oh, everything's okay, grab a Pepsi, innocent mistake, you know. But the reality is they had to bring in uh, black communicators. They had to, you know, change their lens and really look at things in a different way in order to be able to communicate um, in the tone and in the, the persona that's needed to really reach and impact people across the board. And so I think that's a really good example of writing a wrong. And then one last quick example is right here in Washington, DC, uh, the team name has gone from Redskins, which um, has been so controversial for a long time as it relates to Native Americans and indigenous, indigenous right. communities. And so we're seeing that wrong being righted by, you know, removing that name and moving into a name that is not inflammatory. Absolutely. Um, I really hope that, you know, I think there's a big game coming up on Sunday and well, let's hope that there are not a ton of those messages uh, yeah. that popped up last time, but it, it, there has been a lot of accountability that has come up. Uh, Chris, I think that um, I was going through, it's part of my whole research uh, on this topic, uh, to take a look at Jazz and Lincoln Center's Instagram. Um, and I noticed something very special about, you know, that time for you guys in which you made mention, uh, you know, there was, uh, there were two posts of solidarity and then there was one that just flat out acknowledged that, you know, you guys did not feel that, um, uh, you know, the initial response was sufficient enough. Um, what went into that decision to, you know, essentially just make it own up publicly to that mistake? And how important do you think that is in the conversation uh, that we're having, uh, you know, just now in terms of social uh, engagement? That's a great question, Tevin. I, you know, I think, again, going back to this process of acknowledgement as an institution and then as a group of people in an organization trying to make things happen year over year, um, this was a big part of that. And so, you know, there would be no Jazz and Lincoln Center if, if not for Wynton Marsalis. And he is, uh, you know, such an amazing American uh, cultural figure. And with that comes the weight of so many different things, um, you know, both tangibly and intangibly. And, and tangibly, you know, that it, it, you know, we are a nonprofit institution. We thrive primarily based on the, the content and the location of our institution. And so um, there's a lot riding on every word that comes out of Winton's mouth. And, and he's very cognizant of that. And, you know, there's a, a couple years ago where, you know, uh, in, in an interview out of context, um, you know, there were things that uh, Winton touched on in that conversation that touched on race and culture and specifically hip hop. And, um, you know, I think those, those are experiences for him as a human being that were have been challenging um, to to know that his words are not just the words of a of a musician, a historian, a, a, a an entrepreneur, um, yeah. but also you know they represent uh, you know kind of a higher level of leadership in in the in the culture. And so 
Winton made a statement and that statement represented Jazz and Lincoln Center. But unfortunately, at the time, Jazz and Lincoln Center staff and employees were not involved in that in that process. And so we had to have an internal acknowledgement of that. And, and, you know, given the time of the pandemic, I don't know if, you know, if one thing didn't happen, you know, pandemic or, or certain things didn't happen the way they did. I don't know if we would have had the space to really, really chew on what happened, but we did. And and so from that came, you know, what you what you were able to see. And, and that was more of a collective acknowledgement. And to what we're saying, specific words matter. Um, you know, they those words carry such a heavy weight because for so long they haven't been said. And mm-hmm. so um, that, you know, that's again, that's one of those things where I'm saying, you know, in the last 10 months for us, it, it has really been um, a, um, a, a transformative process. So. Absolutely. Uh, Crystal, has there ever been a moment in which you've kind of dealt with a similar thing in which it's, uh, you know, this, we tried to create this message surrounding um, racial justice that did not quite hit the mark, uh, you know, how are we going to kind of change the course to actually tell the story that we want to tell? Absolutely. Lots of moments, countless moments. I would never name a client ever, but um, I you don't have, have to. Had, <laughs> yes. I have had situations where the messaging, the visuals have gone so wrong. Um, you know, instances of, you know, visuals where um, Black people were depicted more as um, charity than actual. Um, successful individuals or messaging where um, it was focused more so on the wounds versus the assets of the Black community. And so when I think about some of the crisis communications and public relations that we've had to do at Black Creative Group, it really uh, was from a place of our clients being misinformed on how to communicate and, and how to select visuals and wording um, that's really appropriate for the times we live in. And so some of the tactics that I've used is asset-based uh, messaging, which is what I briefly spoke on, this ability to speak to the assets of the community versus you know the things we all are so aware of. And so when you ask that question about you know clients or individuals who have made mistakes or missteps, you know, the way to really bounce back and to fix it is to do it swiftly, um, is to do it with diverse voices at the table and to really, um, you know, make sure you have a strategy in place in case that your plan B even backfires. And so thinking ahead, I think a lot of organizations and even individuals, you know, we're in this age where you can tweet and say anything, you know, I think it's really a time to be more intentional with our words. And it's really a time to, to use words that, that elevate and celebrate each other because it's, it's tough times for everyone Absolutely. with this pandemic layered with racial injustices and then layered with ignorance of, of, of white and other just truly not understanding or knowing actually what's happening in the world when it comes to race and identity, whether it's in the arts, whether it's in everyday life, such as jogging while black, breathing while black, it's, it's really a time to start to have meaningful conversations. So it's conversation like this that, that I just, I value so much. Yes, I, I value it too, especially, you know, the opportunity just to learn so much from the three of you. It's just, it's great. Uh, Beth, uh, you work with a lot of, uh, you know, with different clients in the arts from organizations to individuals. Um, in terms of this conversation uh, where, you know, mistakes are made or, you know, the, the path is not straightforward, how do you support your, you know, the individual artists and in their messaging so that they understand, you know, it's not about saying everything perfect all the time, but it is about, you know, moving forward. How does that work with individual artists? Yeah, um, I should say first that I'm pretty lucky to have really um, self-aware, socially committed artists on my roster. I think, um, because I've been really clear about stating my values, I tend to have clients come to me who share those values. Um, so, you know, 
there wasn't a tremendous amount of hand wringing or shock <laughs> last summer <laughs> because we were already aware of these issues. We were already thinking about them. Um, I think that most of my clients, um, particularly my white clients, were really just thinking about how best to support, um, how best to amplify other people's lived experiences. Um, for instance, Jamie Barton, for a couple months, we just held all of the messaging and our own projects that we had planned to shout about. And instead we sh shared other people's posts and stories with thoughtful commentary. Um, I'm also not a fan of like the just straight up sharing. Like I did see some organizations whose Instagram stories for a month or two were just constant sharing of other stories and posts, but with no engagement and no thoughtful commentary and no nothing showing us what they were taking away or what they wanted us to take away from these stories. Um, and I thought Jamie did a really good job of, of sharing a little bit about what she was learning and what she hoped her followers would learn from the content that she was sharing. Absolutely. Um, what was the other part of your question? Tevin, I'm so sorry. I've only had no, one coffee today, guys. You're totally, oh man, I can use a second cup myself. It's totally fine because actually, you know, I wanted to ask one final question before we open up to, uh, to, the, uh, to the audience. Uh, you know, we've, in my own surfing of Instagram, because I, I may be addicted to it or something, um, I've seen two different approaches, uh, two different approaches to social justice, specifically on social media. I've seen a number of Instagram groups, uh, you know, in a, you know, in a positive and, you know, in a way that aims to hold organizations accountable for the promises that they are making at this time. Um, and so I'm talking about organizations like the Black, Op Black Opera Alliance, um, the Orchestra of Racist Instagram group, the Opera's Racist Instagram group, things like that. Um, you know, their whole focus is on accountability for previous actions and for the future. I also see on the other side, uh, organizations like Color of Classical, Colors of Classical Music, uh, Opera Next Gen, that focus on, uh, you know, impact or empowering artists, uh, similar to what Burisma does, um, through, you know, telling their stories uh, or telling the stories and the philosophies of why they actually exist in this industry uh, and what their vision is. I think that to me, you know, both of these are crucial parts. You're trying to get, uh, the, you know, messages of accountability and messages of empowerment. Um, what are what are your thoughts on these two uh, very opposite um, but kind of similar minded uh, approaches to social media strategy? Uh, Crystal? Really great question. And it actually takes me back to um, this was mentioned maybe even offline again, maybe you mentioned it, Beth, about kind of staying away from call out culture and moving more into empowerment. And I think, you know, when we think about these different approaches, it's easy to, you know, point out the problems. It's easy to say, you know, President Trump, this or that, or, you know, it's easy to, to call out and point out and, and create this, this messaging and culture around council culture. And I would say, you know, instead of that approach, take that energy and use that energy to empower others, to talk about the solutions to the problems. And so I think what we're seeing a lot is that, you know, organizations tend to, and individuals tend to take the approach of calling out the problem and, and really focusing on why it's wrong and why it's being done. But the problem is not one man, one president or one institution. The problem is systemic and we all play a role in providing solutions to the problem. And so when I think of the approaches that can be done, whether it's on social media as an organization or as an individual, I think the approach really has to be focused on empowerment and solutions. Great. Beth, I see you're uh, nodding your head. Do you have any more thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I agree with Crystal 100%. I think uh, with the kinds of accounts you mentioned that are, are striving for accountability, I think I have a few worries always with that approach. The first one is that it requires our colleagues of colors to be tremendously vulnerable. Um, and I, I hate that they have to open up their wounds publicly in that way. 
I understand the value in it. I do think that there are a lot of people um, who aren't having that lived experience who just aren't aware of it, whether because they haven't seen her or because they haven't allowed themselves to see it, but they're not aware of it. So I understand the value in that, but it, it, I, I don't love that people have to open up their wounds publicly like that. Um, I also do think that the kind of salacious nature of it, like that kind of gossipy, like, did you know that this happens? Like, I don't think that that engenders maybe the best energy for tackling the problems. Um, and I worry that white people reading those stories will feel like reading on them and commenting on them is doing the work in some way. <laughs> uh and that ain't it so uh i think that those are my concerns with that approach Absolutely. you know obviously with with as much work and belief as i have in mentorship i agree with crystal 100 about elevating and empowerment as maybe a healthier way to expend our energy and a way to affect that change um yeah that's that's my that's my main thought on that and Chris, you are you also kind of in the same thread of, you know, as opposed to the, you know, I guess the call out culture focusing more on the uh, empowerment of individuals within your community, within your institution or? Well, you know, I mean, I, I think it's, it has to be said that any of these social media platforms are such powerful tools for storytelling and, you know, Colors of Classical or any of the operas, races, dances, races platforms are kind of two arms of a similar debate um, that, I, that I, I do think has value. Um, any opportunity for a public square, there's going to be some yelling and shouting. Um, but I do think there are kind of pockets um, of real growth, you know, people finding out and hearing stories that they, they might not have connected with. Um, you know, right, you know, just in their regular day lives. And then I also think of just the examples that it gives to a next generation that is scrolling through the various dances and stuff, they might see some of these things and they might catch on and, and you know, you never know what story might, uh, you know, inspire that next generation of, of uh, musicians, specifically musicians of color based on, you know, these, these platforms, you know, um, and, and I think when I say that, I think more of the, the colors of classical music, I think it's just a great, great platform of telling and giving a different kind of uh, view of what these musicians look like um, and that they, they're, you know, it's, it's not necessarily what you, you might see, you know, yeah, they'll let uh, Kendrick Lamar have a, an orchestra and it's an all white orchestra, but in the world, there actually are uh, people of color who compose um, orchestras. And, and I think that's a, it's a great opportunity for, you know, younger people to, to see that and, and latch onto it because it does, it does inspire them. Um, I, I do on the other side of the coin, you know, these, these platforms like the operator races and stuff like that, I think there's a place for them. Um, it is an opportunity for people to talk. I, I think my fear with that is that um, too often those conversations are off, line after the people have left those institutions. Um, and, I, and I wonder how effective that is. Uh, and, you know, it's tough to have those conversations while you're at the institution. And a lot of times I hear, or I, when I see some of these posts, it's like, you know, I'm not there anymore as if that fixes the problem or, or you know, they right. really love it. And I'm not knocking those people, but I just mean in the sense of the real hard work that has to be done um, needs to be done internally. And that's why the challenge is, you know, for these institutions to, to dedicate space um, for people of color and, and places of agency and leadership and, and also in the programming and repertoire, um, you know, that, that they're, they're rolling out. And, you know, if people are in a place where they might have a more homogenous kind of locality, like you got to figure out how to bring some of those things in, you know, that takes work, that takes hard conversations um, and some, some, you know, some internal curiosity um, that, I, that I think is warranted for, you know, any of this programming and, and uh, arts initiatives we're talking about. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Thank all. Thank you all uh, for such great answers uh, on a really, really loaded question. <laughs> um, I wanted to uh, open up to some questions from the audience and Chris, you had already touched on one of them. Uh, so this question uh, is, uh, I work in, or this person works in a rural, largely racially homogenous uh, white uh, community. Uh, what are some strategies for communicating the urgency of these issues to a population who may feel distant from their effects? Uh, Chris, do you have any insights on that question? That's a really good one. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think I think some strategies would be starting from a training perspective, uh, really bringing in some outside training um, individuals. There, there's an array of experts out there, whether it's, um, you know, race-based experts that can come in and do training around racial sensitivities and insensitivities, things of that nature. There's experts um, in the communication space that can come in and, and help to enlighten and really um, widen the perspective around how to communicate during you know, challenging times. So I think the first step um, for the individual that asks that question is to really um, look at opportunities where it could be a collective learning experience. Because what we've also seen was, you know, in the days of the George Floyd protests, we've seen where uh, internally Black and people of color have, you know, aggressively held their CEOs accountable to make these statements, which is um, on one end, absolutely positively the way to go. But on the other end, it can polarize, um, become polarizing. And internally, what we've seen is that it, it can become more of a threat, if you will, instead of a request. So I would say to that individual, go the route of making sure you strike that balance to where it doesn't feel as though a threat in terms of you have to do this as an organization, you have to do X, Y, and Z, and more go the route of saying, hey, this is a learning experience for everyone. You know, I would love for us to have a collective training session where we bring in someone that can actually um, show us a new way of processing and, and communicating around some very important issues. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, the next question uh, is what strategies or processes did you or do you currently employ to establish authentic trust between stakeholders? So this can be between organizations and communities, uh, between uh, you know, artists and organizations, et cetera. How do we establish authentic trust between these stakeholders? Uh, Beth, what are your thoughts on this question? Um, so I think the best way to build trust is to deserve it does that make any sense like, Earn it, yeah like be authentic in how you're presenting yourself um i think uh the tenor russell thomas does a really good job of this like that man is real online um he i remember he was doing an opera production set in like maybe the 1700s and they brought out like kind of a jerry curl wig and he posted about it he was like what what is what is this doing for this character this is not realistic he also posts like um, when he's in Europe and he's having a hard time finding a barber to do his hair properly. He posts about that. I make him sound like he only posts about hair. That, that's not it. But like he also, something I really, really love that he did last year a lot is he like spoke into existence what he wanted for himself. So when all of these organizations were writing about how they wanted to be like forwarding voices of color and they wanted to be hiring people, he wrote very plainly, great hire me. Here is what I can do for your organization. I want to be a leader in arts administration and here's what I'm going to do. And just last week, LA Opera announced that they brought him on. I think they're calling it like an artist in residence, but it's not like a, I'm going to pop in and curate some recitals position. He's starting a training program that's going to target students from HBCUs. He is doing training for students in underrepresented communities in LA. He's bringing in Black composers, Black performers, and it's like this really wide ranging collaboration. And I think that because he was always willing to speak authentically to what his experience was in companies and on the road and what he wanted to see happen, I think he kind of spoke that into existence, which I just, I really admire. Absolutely. Uh, and I would uh, also like to add some of my own observations uh, from an organizational standpoint. We, you know, I observe a lot of things in which, you know, in regards to education programs, you wonder if, you didn't need them, would they actually exist in organizations? If you were selling tickets, would you actually, would organizations actually be doing this? And I apply the same question to diversity. Why are we doing this? Is this because we want to, uh, we want more people to buy tickets because we want to see more people of color in the audience? Or is it because we want to serve our community? 
Uh, and when you run an organization or uh, a, an Instagram page or anything that's dedicated towards the common good or towards the public good, it, you have to stay clear to that mission and how your connection with the community fosters that uh, service to the public good. So I think as long as you can answer your why you're trying to build that connection and trust with, because it's the right and necessary thing to do to fulfill our mission, um, you know, you're starting with an authentic goal, which will lead to authentic communication and authentic trust. Um, uh, this next question, uh, this question four, uh, or this fourth question I'm going to see, uh, how do you remain unapologetic about racial justice for Black, Indigenous people, Black, Indigenous people of color, while trying to be accessible to people that, uh, or people at different places in their anti-racist journeys? Uh, so I'm going to ask that again. How do you remain unapologetic about racial justice? for uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color while trying to be accessible to people uh, at different places in their anti-racist journeys. Um, Chris, uh, you want to take this answer for her, take this question first? Yeah, I, and I, I think it really piggybacks off what you were saying, Tevin. I, I think it to remain un unapologetic, you need to lead with your goal and stick to the goal and never let the goal um, be superseded by whatever you think the reception is going to be to that goal. And so what I mean is if you have a campaign, if you start getting into the, the wish the kind of guessing game of, well, how are people gonna respond and what are they gonna think? Then you're, you've already kind of lost because you're, you're, you're now trying to cater to uh, you know, people's insecurities. And I think, you know, but part of this topic is just uncomfortable. Um, and, and you know, how do we make the uncomfortable palatable is different than you know, how do we adjust it to the point where people feel just totally comfortable. Um, so. That's, that's my thought on that. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Crystal, do you have any uh, thing to add to that uh, question? Yeah, I think, I think it's a great question that came from um, someone in the audience. I, I definitely think if you're asking that question about being unapologetic, you're in a good space because that means you're fearless, but you're fearless coming from a good place of wanting to impact change and positive change. And I think that when you're unapologetic and you're, and you're fearless about you know, making this sort of change, it really allows you to speak up. And so when you're sitting in a company meeting and you see a presentation and it's all white people or, or maybe one Asian person or et cetera, you're able to speak up and say, hey, it's, it's 2021, we've had a black president. We know that race relations are very real. We know that, you know, America is diverse. And so you're able to speak from that space of just, um, fearlessly and unapologetically saying, you know, this is unacceptable. We can no longer present things in this nature or communicate in this nature. And so I think that that absolutely needs to be um, the mindset we have going forward is that there's a way to be unapologetic, but still be kind and still be, you know, fruitful in what you bring to the table. And so I say to anyone out there listening, absolutely be unapologetic and fearless when it comes to inclusivity. Absolutely, thank you, Crystal, and thank you, Chris. Uh, Beth, this next question is for you because I think between you and I, we we see a lot of this, especially working in opera. Um, do we run the risk of uh, further marginalizing uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, uh, members of the LGBTQ community uh, who are artists or students? Uh, you know, if we are, you know, as we are fe repeatedly featuring them in visual ads. Uh, and featuring them as spotlighted representatives. Uh, is, are we further marginalizing those groups if they're not actually uh, representing the true body of people that they're a part of? Hmm. I don't know if I would say that we're further marginalizing those groups. Um, I, get what they're, I get what they're asking about sort of that making someone the poster boy and tokenizing them. Um, I'm a big believer in if you can see it, you can be it. So I do think it's important that we show people from a range of races and sexualities and gender identities um, in our organizational promotions. Because I'm thinking about the people who are gonna see those ads or see those posts and who might see themselves in them. 
I think that's super important. And I think it's probably more effective than talking about our hopes for what our student body might look like, for example. Yep. I think it's stronger to show what we hope it looks like. What do you think? I was, you know, I'm thinking the same thing. It's kind of, on one hand, you want to make sure that when you're creating those, uh, you know, these materials and whatnot, you're, uh, you know, people will either do it because they say we want, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we're not coming off as racist and, you know, you're essentially tokenizing those people, which I think is where this question comes from. Uh, but at the same time, there's the thing that you, you just said, uh, at times organizations will do that, not necessarily to show like, oh, hey, we have this black person, we have uh, this person from the LGBTQ community, but it's also to show we, this, you know, even if we're not here, this is where we, you know, we want to be inclusive. Uh, I think there is power in, you know, having that kind of representation in your materials uh, to say that, uh, to say, you know, this is our vision for our future. This is our vision for a more racially or for a more equitable field. Um, so it's, you know, I see it both ways because I've seen it used and I've seen people used as tokens in marketing materials, but I think that uh, it's also possible to use that as a, uh, you know, a strategy for growth for uh, as a way to actually say, you know, we're going to do this, uh, even if it doesn't look like this all the time. And if I could add uh, yeah, on to that, Chris, if I may, yeah, I think it, I think it does more good than bad um, mm -hmm. when you, you elevate um, diverse voices, when you elevate uh, Black artists and Black, um, you know, creatives. And, you know, it's really about giving us our flowers. And it's, it's really about paying homage to the, the untapped potential and the talent that often goes overlooked because of racial bias is really, you know, for example, even Justin Bieber came out what last, last summer or so and really just said, you know, my entire persona, my music, everything influ that influences me is all dedicated and all due to black culture. And so it's statements like that, that are not only authentic, you know, it, it appeared as though it was coming from an authentic place, but it's necessary to say that, hey, like everything that I do and have learned has been from black culture or this culture or that culture. And so I think when it comes to elevating different narratives and elevating different creatives, I think it's more than just posting a picture and saying kind things, but I, I, it's, it's really about acknowledging and it's really about helping to shape the perspective that opera music isn't just for a certain demographic or the love of the cello isn't for a certain individual age or ethnicity wise. And so I think it's so important to, to showcase the diversity of you know black artists and black creatives. Absolutely. Chris, do you have anything else to add for this question? It's a really, really good question, actually. Yeah, yeah, it is an awesome question. And, and I would just say the, the only way I think it's could ever be maybe perceived as marginalizing those those communities is if, you know, there's not some sort of resource put behind those efforts. You know, if you just got a picture and you're using the picture, that's one thing. But, you know, I got to shout out Alpha, who was in, in a recent New York Times article who just said, look, you know, if you're going to you're going to participate in this equity and diversity thing, you know, you got to be in the long game. So if you're doing that, it's got to not just be in the moment. It's not just when you make the statement, but the actions you take after that statement, right? So what are you going to do for the next five years of marketing, right? What are you going to do for the next five years of, of programming? What are you going to do the next five years of hiring within your organization? And so I, I think it's, it's great if you're already thinking about that dynamic of marginalization, but I think it's, if you're going deeper, then you're taking the right steps. If you're not, then that's your answer. Absolutely. Uh, and so you touched on hiring, which is great because it's the next question that uh, someone asked. Uh, and I think for all of us as leaders, we, you know, we end up hiring a number of people. And the, in your hiring processes, um, how specific are you uh, with your inquiries when you are hoping to bring on a, uh, you know, a person of color or someone from a marginalized um, uh, community uh, when you're hoping to bring those people into your organization. Uh, is there any way to approach this without, uh, you know, 
without actually being discriminatory um, or uh, trying to understand the last part. Um, or is there any way that we can uh, kind of, I guess, crowdsource with other organizations? Or is there any way that we can, uh, you know, communicate we're, what we're looking for and what we're trying to change without being, uh, you know, discriminatory against those same groups? It's kind of the same question as, you know, the previous one about marginalization. Uh, Beth, what are your thoughts on this? Crystal, I see you have your mic off. Do you want to yeah. jump in here? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I would right. love to, because this is, this is a really great and intimate question for me, actually. And so, um, as you all know, the name of um, the organization that I co-own is Black Creative Group. And so we are unapologetically Black. We really wanted to hone in on what we specialize in, in communicating to BIPOC audiences. And so when it came to hiring, one of the first things we did was make sure that we had a diverse team, actually, even though we're black creative group, we are, you know, really focused on the founders, you know, at the core being black, but our team, we have white people on our team, we have LGBT individuals, we have um, individuals just from an array of background. And so our core team um, is, is definitely somewhat diverse. And that really came from a place of we didn't want to be a part of what has hindered us for so long. So although at the core, the, the founders, myself and uh, Mike, who's also the co-founder, although at the core, we're a black owned um, agency, we really focus on communicating to communities of color. We knew that we wanted to build something that was against everything that's held us back in our corporate experiences. And so we were very intentional about making our team diverse but also making sure that it was just a great fit. So we didn't want to just hire other, whether that was white or, or any other ethnicity, um, just because we really wanted to make sure that the individual understood that um, we're coming from a place of, we want to be inclusive, but we also want to be really true and authentic in terms of who we are as black creatives. So I love that question around striking that balance and um, being authentic and being clear and transparent on who you are and what you do, but mm -hmm. also not being um, a hypocrite. And, and that's what really, you know, we brainstormed and sat down and we said, it's, it's no way we could be a hypocrite. It's no way we can have, um, you know, an all black institution, which I'm also for, whether it's an HBCU, whether it's an organization, a sorority that's all black, that's, that's a beautiful thing. It should be respected and appreciated on its own. But for us personally, we felt that we didn't want to create something that mimicked what has harmed us for so long, which is this idea of excluding others from such a beautiful opportunity to be a part of um, the greater good. Absolutely. I'm hearing a lot of recurring themes of, you know, it, it being unapologetic, being authentic and most importantly being or you know those are equally important but also being intentional in your choices mm -hmm. um and it, you know that seems like a common thread throughout a lot of this messaging is that you know or a lot of what we're saying in terms of messaging and communicate uh, strategic communications is just be authentic about what it is you're trying to do and make sure that you know you're very intentional about how you're doing it. Uh, one of the last questions that we have time for uh, is for arts marketers or for marketing um, uh, marketing professionals at predominantly white institutions. Uh, how can uh, how can we spark conversations to make change within the organization? Uh, you know, you're facing an institution that is so focused on, uh, you know, how it's been done, how can we change those conversations to be more uh, socially minded? Uh, Chris, did you touch on this one? Yeah, yeah, th that's a great question. Um, and it's, for me, uh, my wife works in higher ed, uh, in admissions. Um, and so we have conversations a lot about diversity and inclusion. And we actually both met uh, at a predominantly white uh, university, um, University of Virginia. And, you know, I, when I think about that school um, up until the sixties, it was a good old boy school. Only white males went to the school. Um, some years into the seventies, black men were allowed and then women finally were allowed. And 
um, you know, I think that's a, when I think about that, that's kind of how this has to work, right? You know, in order to not discriminate, I would say, you got to have people who are people of a diverse pool of, of applicants, right? And I would say you have to challenge yourself as an institution to understand that with the diverse applicant pool, um, they might look a lot different on paper. And so you have to go through the process to really understand what you have um, as an option. And so, you know, I think that challenge comes with really opening the pool, um, maybe understanding the, the, how you can change some of your earmarks for uh, what's required for the role, because, you know, some of those things that you, you think might require a certain or specific degree or whatnot might not necessarily be the case. And so, you know, I think it's just a matter of, of uh, it, committing to a percentage of your uh, hiring pool being diverse, um, whether that's 15%, 25% or whatever. I, I think it comes down to opening the door and allowing people to actually walk through the door, take a seat and have a conversation with you. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. Uh, that is the end of this session. Uh, again, I want to thank you, send a really big thank you to all three of our panelists, Beth, uh, Chris, Crystal, thank you guys so much for offering your expertise uh, and all of your experience. Um, you know, the main themes of this, uh, it be intentional, be unapologetic and be authentic. Um, thank you all to everyone who's tuning in and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of Sphinx Connect. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you all. Take care. Stay safe.